members, come on up if you will. We need you up here. Come ahead. Amen. Thank you, Miss Jody. Wonderful song there. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. Welcome to Old First, everyone. Glad you are here this morning. Uh, just got a couple of announcements first. Just thank you uh, for yesterday. We had a great time. Good crowd. And, uh, and thank you for all those that made the fish fry possible. And uh, yeah, really good time. A couple other things. Fall Fest, a trunk or treat is coming up, so we need candy for that. And that's always a, a big turnout. And so if you can provide candy, please do so. And then uh, no adult Bible study tonight. Uh, just after a busy week and weekend, we need to take time and rest. All right. Well, that is it for the announcements. Let's go ahead and have a time of guided prayer, and then we will sing. Just ask God to give you a heart today ready to hear from Him. Ask God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear the truth. If there is any sin weighing you down this morning. Repent of that right now. And know that when you repent, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Ask Him to help you sing out. And to worship Him today in spirit and truth. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand for our first songs. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light of my path. Worship with you when you sing this morning, will you? Don't just sing words, just worship Him. Is 
is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid and I think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet my heart forever is wandering. Jesus, be my guide and hold me to your side. I will love you to the end. a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my past. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my past. For thee, O Lord, are high above all this morning. Sing, we exalt thee. Sing, we exalt thee again. We exalt thee. Yes, we do, Lord. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh, Lord, sing it to him now. We We do for Jesus. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh Lord. Remain standing if you will. All right, our scriptural call to worship this morning is from Psalm chapter 96. Psalm 96. This is the word of the Lord. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. 
For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the, earth, let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this text. God, we do want to lift up all those who have been very... Their lives have been devastated by this hurricane. God, thank you that we have disaster relief organizations in the SBC, Franklin Graham's organization that goes to places like this and helps people with material needs, but also to share with them the amazing good news of Christ. So may you make their work fruitful. And even in this tragedy, would you work through it and do great things. God, we love you and we praise you. All glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. That 
Join with me in reading this scripture, Colossians 3. Read it with me if you will. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For if you died and your life is hidden in Christ, in God, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful promise. Sing with me, I will serve him. Choir, stand with me if you will. Ruin lies 
in life to sing that again heartaches and broken pieces sing it now oh heartaches broken pieces ruined lives are why you died on Calvary your touch was what I Tower, there is light and life, there is help and power in the spirit, in the spirit of the Lord, where the spirit of the Lord, yes, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's love, there is love. Oh, there's comfort in life's darkest hour. There is light and life, there is help and power in the Spirit. In the spirit of the Lord. Ushers, you come forward if you will.
sing it with me. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Sing it to him now. It is well with my soul. Yes, it is. Oh, it Thank you, Jody. <laughs> well, if you missed our fifth Sunday singing, you missed a good time. And I'll tell you what, I was so blessed by a song that evening that I've asked uh, Jeff and, and the ladies to come and sing it again because I want you who might have missed it to hear it. There's honey in the rock. Come on, kids, sing it. It's not hard to see, only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. I keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing. Honey. 
we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. May these words be pleasing to you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was about seven years old, I walked an aisle At a church service, made a decision. A few months later, I was then dunked under some water. At that time, I knew all the answers to all the questions about what it meant to be saved and baptized. And yet, I do not believe that at that time I was truly born again. As I grew older, I was not necessarily an outwardly rebellious child. uh, But I had dark and rebellious thoughts in my heart and mine, mostly during my junior high years, which are hard years for many people. And I can say that there were even times where I was angry at the church, angry at God because of the pressures and expectations that came from growing up in a ministry family, and which, by the way, I will do whatever I can, and Alex will as well, to help my boys not feel that pressure. But when I was about 15 years old, I... The summer before my sophomore year of high school, I went to a centrifuge camp in Glorieta, New Mexico. You may have been there. And I did not go to this camp with a church group, but my parents were attending a conference. And so I, uh, you know, was placed in a group with other kids whose parents were also attending a conference. And they called our group the YWPs, which meant youth with parents. Very original. Obviously, none of us knew one another, and so we had to make friends with strangers. But because of this, I did not have the normal distractions of a youth camp, like trying to impress your friends or some other girl who went to camp with the group. And so it really allowed me to focus on what was being preached and taught during the camp. The camp pastor for the week was also... Our dodgeball teacher, not really sure how or why this happened, but I really appreciated he did both. And since I was in his dodgeball class, I really paid attention. And so it was during one night of worship that while he was preaching, I was absolutely tuned in. And it was hard to explain what exactly was happening in my heart and mind, but God was working in my heart in a powerful way, and I felt during the sermon a deep conviction of sin. I knew that I was a sinner in need of a Savior, and when it came time for the invitation, I just stood up knowing that I needed Christ. After I went forward, they took us back uh, to visit with a counselor, you know, about what was going on in our hearts and minds, and The poor guy visiting with me just really had no idea how to help me. I knew there was something different in my heart and soul that had occurred, but I just had a hard time explaining it. And so that night as I walked back to my parents' room after 
finishing everything for the evening, I walk back looking at the stars, which I still love to do, amazed by God's creation, knowing that something had changed within me. And while I did not know exactly what had happened at the time, I can now look back and say, that was the night I was truly born again. God saved me and I truly placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For the rest of high school, I grew in my faith. We started a young men's Bible study that met on lunch on Fridays. We called it Fishers of Men. My senior year of high school, my youth pastor took me and a few others to breakfast on Friday mornings, and he discipled us. I even had a very unique government teacher who would ask me difficult Bible questions, tell me that I, and I didn't want to hear this, but he would tell me that I was going to be a Baptist preacher. And he even let me do the assigned 20-page research paper on the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. And as I graduated high school, I went to Lamar University. Something began nagging at my soul once again. And my greatest fear was coming true. And that was God was calling me into the ministry. I visited with my pastor and told him what I thought God was calling me to do. And he, along with many others at First Baptist Church Buna, confirmed and indeed, that indeed God was calling me into ministry. But of course, there was a slight problem. I told him that since I was truly saved at the age of 15, I had actually never been truly baptized. The first time, I just got wet. And so at the age of 19, as a freshman in college, I was baptized at FBC Buna, and my call to ministry began. During my 20s, I did many fun things. God allowed me to work as a teacher and coach. He gave me an opportunity to go to Ukraine, where I still have amazing friendships with those people there to this day. I went to Louisville, Kentucky to study at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, made friends for life. At about the age of 28, though, I ran out of money and just didn't really have a good vision for why I was in seminary at that time. And so I moved back to Texas to work again as a teacher and coach and save money. But God did bless me during that time, and he grew me. I took seminary classes online. We We started a young adult Bible study in Silsby, and I developed really deep friendships with several godly people during that time. Active in my church. But within me, though, there was a loneliness. I wanted to be married. I prayed to be married, and yet God in his providence did not allow me to fulfill that desire. When I was 30 years old, so 10 years ago, Frustration with another swing and miss in the world of dating caused me to leave Texas once again, go back to Kentucky and finish my seminary degree. And at that time, I had no idea why all of these things were taking place. But now as I look back, I know exactly why they occurred. For it was at that time when I became good friends with a six foot three Serbian girl. Our relationship did not start then. It started five years later in 2019 when I was serving as a pastor in Crockett, Texas area. And she came to help with our vacation Bible school and youth camp at the East Texas Baptist Encampment in Newton. And so I like to make a joke that Alex and I in our 30s fell in love at youth camp. As I reflect on God's providence, it truly astounds me all he has done in both of our lives. Oh, God brought Alex to America from a non-Christian family. He saved her. He got her connected to a Christian family in Oklahoma, and they sent her to seminary in Kentucky to study theology. God in his providence saved me, called me into ministry when I did not want to go. He used difficulties and heartbreaks to get me to Kentucky where I would meet and eventually marry Alex. And now uh, we got three rowdy boys who's one day going to be holy troublemakers for the kingdom of God. I am definitely a blessed man. 
So why have I taken time to tell you all these things this morning? I tell you these things because I want you to see me as a man who's been saved and changed by the grace of God. But recently I've been slandered. I have been condemned to hell, declared not a Christian, and many false rumors were said about me. But brothers and sisters, I am your brother in the Lord Jesus, and I am not your enemy. And most of us are aware a growing problem and divide has occurred in our church over the nature of how we interpret various biblical passages. I, along with some others in the church, hold to what is known as Reformed theology, or as some people call it, Calvinism. And these terms, while they, do, they are close, they do have some distinctions. And so as I talk about these things today, I will mostly use the term Reformed theology because it leaves room for various differences and nuances of belief for the Christians who hold to it. And finally, Reformed theology gets its name from the Reformation and the men who worked hard to rescue the church from the problems and false teachings that were being taught at that time by the Roman Catholic Church. About a year and a half ago, I decided, as I was preaching through Ephesians, I decided to make you aware that, yes, I did hold to this reform theology. But I also said that you were welcome to disagree with me. And so I found out that, yeah, some agreed, some did not, and some just did not know. Now, just so you will know, I've actually held to this theology, or at least it started, for my entire adult life. When I was a senior in high school, I was taking a a dual credit college English class. And we were studying early American literature, uh, particularly Jonathan Edwards and his great classic sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, if you've read that before. The teacher, who I, I think was Church of Christ, if I'm not mistaken, she decided for some reason to go over the various beliefs of Reformed theology and essentially to make fun of it. But it had the opposite effect on me. I thought it made some sense. And so I went home that day and asked Dad about it, and he told me that most modern Baptists hold to some of the elements of Reformed theology. For example, the idea that a person is truly saved, he is always saved, that's an idea from Reformed theology. Roman Catholics do not believe that. However, even though I hold to these things, it really, like, this is not my identity. In fact, I would much rather focus on other issues like trying to save our nation from destroying itself. In addition, I would much rather be around a non-reformed person who is kind and funny and loyal than to be around a reformed person who is arrogant and a bit of a jerk. One of my best friends from the Crockett area is a man named Jonathan. He's a pastor, he's a Marine, he's a brother in Christ, and we are very, very close. I would stand shoulder to shoulder with him if there was a fight, and he would with me. And you know what? He does not hold my, th- my theology, and that's okay. So brothers and si- sisters, I wish to be your pastor regardless of your theological perspective. If we agree on the essentials like the Trinity, the inerrancy of God's word, that Jesus is the only way to salvation, that Jesus is coming back to rescue his people, then we can lovingly disagree on less important doctrines such as end times things or whether or not a person believes in Reformed theology. We do not have to divide over this issue. We can be united. We can even have fun and robust debates, and yet we leave as friends and stay united. And so what I'd like to do now is just look at a few texts of scriptures and see how we may all faithfully believe the Bible, yet still come to a different conclusion on its interpretation. And you know this one from Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 3 through 6. And Paul says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And then verse 11 of chapter 1, Ephesians. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of of his will. And so when I read these verses and I think about them and I, yes, wrestle with them, I do. I come away with the conclusion that, yes, God chose and predestined his people to be saved before the world was created. And therefore, the reason why I embrace Christ as Lord and Savior at the age of 15 is because, yes, God predestined me to do so, not because I deserved it, but only because of his amazing grace. But the, the non-reformed Christian may look at these verses and say, well, hang on, I have a bit of a different idea. I think God chose and predestined his people because he knew that they would believe. All right, that's what the non-reformed Christian would say. Well, I think that God knew who would believe, and therefore he chose them before the foundations of the world. And so they would point to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And this text says, Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so a non-reformed Christian would say, okay, like we see right here that with God's foreknowledge, he knows who's going to choose him, and therefore he elects them in eternity past based on their decision. That's what a non-reformed person would say. Foreknowledge, God knows what's going to happen, so he elects them based on their decision. Now, as a reformed Christian, I would say, okay... Well, I see what you're saying there, and you know what? Let's admit, that may be the case. But when I look at this verse, I wrestle with this verse, I don't come away with the same conclusion, and this is why. First, when you look up the word foreknow, it is a word that means in the original Greek to know beforehand, or it can also mean to choose beforehand. And so I don't think that, that, that foreknowledge here simply means that God just knows what will happen. I think his foreknowledge is an ordaining foreknowledge. In other words, he doesn't just know the water is going to be wet. His knowledge makes the water wet. In addition, one of the best explanations I've heard about foreknowledge is this. Paul is using this word to reach back into the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the word know, if you have King James, you know this, right? The word know is used to demonstrate an intimate relationship. Like you know your wife. And so in the Old Testament, God knew, chose Right? He, he, he demonst the no here is a demonstration of his covenantal relationship with his people. So let me give you two examples of that. The first one is from Genesis 18, 17 through 19. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Listen to verse 19. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now here's what's interesting. The ESV, as you see, translates that word there as chosen. The Hebrew word is yada, like Yoda, but spelled differently, okay? Yada, which means to know. 
And so we really could translate that, and I think the LSB does, for I have known him. And so God knew Abraham, meaning he chose Abraham. He knew him and established a relationship with him. Let me give you one more example. I'm sure you will all recognize this example. And in this text, God is establishing a relationship and a ministry for someone who is not yet even born. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Yada, same word as we just read. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were, before, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And so you see, when I look at the word foreknowledge... I don't think that Paul is communicating here that God just knows the future. I think what he's doing here, he's pointing back to the Old Testament and how God knew, chose, and established a relationship with his people. And therefore, in my, my position of Romans 8 is this, that when Paul says foreknew, God foreknew us, he is establishing a relationship with us in eternity past that would one day bring about our salvation. But again, loving God. Christians, like my good friend Jonathan, disagree. Well, now let me read a verse that a non-reformed Christian would look to as good evidence for their position, to be as fair as possible this morning. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Paul says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead, here's the prayer, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. And here's the key verse, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. A lot we could say here, but we'll try to make this quick. And first, let's just say that both a Reformed Christian, a non-Reformed Christian, they say amen to this verse, right? It's true, amen. And both positions would say this, that yes, God desires that all people would be saved. But both positions would say this, God has a greater desire that does not include the universal, that means everybody, salvation of all people. In other words, we know that God, I mean, think about it. God, he's God. He has the power to save every single person. He could have saved every single person, but yet we also know that not every person will be saved. And so the non-reformed Christian would say this, that while God desires all people to be saved, he has a greater desire for people to have a choice. And so from the point of view of a non-reformed Christian, they would say, God will not violate a person's free will, and so he desires that all people be saved. He has the power to save everyone, but he does not do so because he wants to give people a choice to be saved or not. That's the non-reformed position. The Reformed position would say, well, yes, God, he has revealed in his word, he desires for all people to be saved. We know that he has the power to save everyone, and yet God has a greater desire and purpose unknown to us. And he has chosen not to save every single person, but to save many. And it may not seem clear right now, but both sides actually have the same difficulty. We must both wrestle with the fact that God, that God, yes, desires that all people will be saved. He has the power to save everyone, and yet we all know that not everyone will be saved. And so as we wrestle with this question, we have to give each other grace and patience. The next verse I want to look at is Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 49. And here we see both God's sovereignty in salvation and man's responsibility to respond in faith. It's a very interesting text. 
Acts 13, verse 44 and following. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth." And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And listen, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And so, as someone who does hold to reform theology... Please understand that I and others like me in this church, we all believe that that you still have a responsibility to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. No one is saved apart from faith in Christ. There will not be anyone in heaven confused as to how they got there. No, they got there through faith in Christ. And there will not be anyone in hell that just really wanted to be saved, but they couldn't because they were not chosen. No, that's not how God's election works. Oh, brothers and sisters, the person who wants to be saved will be, and the person who does not want to be saved will not be. So then, do I believe that God has chosen who will be saved before the earth was created? Yes, I do. Do I believe that whoever truly believes in Jesus Christ for salvation will be saved? Absolutely. Do I believe that God desires for all the people of the world to be saved? Yes, I do. And how do I reconcile all these things in my mind? I don't know. I'm not God. And neither are you. God has all of these things figured out, and I'm just only trying to believe and understand what he has given us in his word. So then, where do we go from here? How do we move forward? First, I think we need to spend more time talking to each other as brothers and sisters about what we believe and why we believe. But we, as we do so, we can't just talk with our emotions with feelings, with insults or slander or whatever. We must talk with open Bibles. We must look to the Scriptures, allow the Scriptures to shape and mold us. And if we do that and we still walk away with different conclusions, that's okay. Second, whether you fall into the reform camp or the non-reform camp, we must realize that both positions are consistent with historical Baptist faith and practice. When the SBC started in the mid-1800s, they held to reform theology. You can look it up. At the turn of the 20th century, it started to become less popular, and so most churches kind of became a mixture of the two, of reformed, non-reformed, which is why many people have never heard of these things until recently. But over the past 30 years, yes, Reformed theology has made quite a bit of a comeback. And so there's many pastors, many members out there who are leaning this way in different degrees and variations. And praise God that right now in the SBC, we have churches reform leaning, non-reform leaning, and yet they are working together to advance the kingdom of God. Number three. I know some of you are very upset about the Constitution's committee's proposal to have the 1689 confession in there. It was a Reformed Baptist confession from history. This was an optional confession that we wanted to place alongside the 2000 Baptist faith and message. Unfortunately, some people felt like 
they were being forced to believe something that you did not want to believe, but that was not the intention or the desire at all of the committee. The idea was to try to create an atmosphere where people who held to reform theology or non reform theology would feel welcome. Fourth, and this one is mainly for our non reformed brothers and sisters. I would ask that you, do not rev- that you do not view Reformed theology as a threat. You can debate, you can argue against it, but please do not view it as a threat or say that those who hold this view need to leave the church, which has been said. Many godly saints, many Baptists have held this view for the past 500 years. And if you know your history, the Southern Baptist Convention went very, very liberal, like not believing the Bible in the 60s and 70s, at least on the seminary level. It was very bad. And there was a good coalition of conservative reformed and non-reformed Baptists who turned the convention around in the late 80s and early 90s. And even now, the SBC kind of maybe sort of wanting to head theologically liberal once again. And and yes, there is a good coalition of non-reformed Baptists and reformed Baptists battling against that. And if I or others in the church cannot convince you that reformed theology is not a threat, then maybe a reformed hymn writer from the 1700s can... This reformed hymn writer wrote these words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. And so brothers and sisters, my desire is for all of us to soften our hearts, to come back together, to get back to the good work that God was doing here. My plea, my desire is that there would be love and unity once again, and even with theological differences on secondary matters, third-level matters. But I also know that for some of you, It may not be possible. In your mind, you were convinced that Reformed theology is a threat. And if that is you, then I guess you have to make a decision. But my one desire this morning... is for there to be love and unity again. And so as we conclude, I just want to say thank you for listening to me as I've shared my heart today. And may God be glorified in my life and in yours. Let's pray. Lord God, may your will be done I would ask that you soften hearts bring us back together and to continue the great work that you were doing here God, I thank you for saving me, for calling me into ministry, dragging me into it. 
and your providence through all the heartache bringing me to Alex. I just thank you for all these blessings. I thank you for your goodness and your grace that has saved a wretch like me. We love you and we praise you and all glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Brother Jim, let's sing our final song, please. Pastor, will there be Bible study tonight? No, sir. Okay. No choir practice tonight. I want you to just stand with me and we're going to change up a little bit. Just a cappella, I want us to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Sing it with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's go in peace. Father, we just thank you for these moments. Lord, uh, we pray that your hand would be over us all. Lord, sometimes we don't know how to pray. Or what to pray for. Lord, I do know this, that your perfect will will be done in all things throughout this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.